Hi guys, I am here with Kevin Kincaid from the It's Always Soccer in Philadelphia podcast and chief editor of Crossing Broad. Did I get that right, Kevin? Yeah, it's I uh, managing editor. I write like about half the stories. We're a Philadelphia sports blog. We do the Eagles, Phillies, Flyers, Sixers. We have more people who are starting to care about the union, so that's nice. But yeah, I've been involved with the union in some way, shape, or form since they started back in uh, 2010. Fantastic. So it's a very, very busy time for any anyone involved in Philadelphia sports at the moment. But just looking, thinking about the soccer wise, how did you get involved in soccer? What was your beginnings in uh, what we would call football? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I played in high school, but I was kind of a late bloomer. So I was never I was kind of behind the curve. I wasn't going to go play in college or anything like that. So I went to school and I got a journalism degree and I uh, took a job down in Georgia and I was working down there at television. And when I was living down there, there was a uh, the announcement that Philadelphia was getting an expansion team. Mm. Um, you know, when I, when I was growing up in the Philadelphia region, we didn't have a team. So for people who were paying attention to MLS in the Philadelphia region, you kind of maybe like paid attention to DC United or, or uh, the New York, New Jersey Metro stars at the time before they became yeah. the Red Bulls. Yeah. Ben Olsen, Ben Olsen was a Pennsylvania guy. So when he played for DC back in the day, there was kind of like a Pennsylvania mm -hmm. connection there. But uh, no, I, 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 saw that announcement i was like oh that's cool philly deserves a team you know there's a there's a good grassroots like kind of fan base there so i moved back to philadelphia in 2010 and uh i was working uh for a television station there for a local news station and i had some extra hours i was looking for and the philadelphia union went on facebook and they said hey we're looking for some people to help us uh uh do some stories for the website contribute to the website and i was like oh that's perfect you know i got some extra hours here uh trying to just fill in my resume at that point. It wasn't really about the money. So I hooked up with the union. I worked for the union um, from 2010 to 2014. And then I left um, the team to cover uh, to cover the union as like an independent reporter for other media outlets. So I did that from 2014 to 2017. Launched It's Always Soccer in Philadelphia. And then after I left the, the beat, uh, quote unquote, you know, um, just been involved with the team in some way, shape or form ever since. You know, I, I do the podcast. I'll write the occasional story for Crossing Broad. I do video breakdowns on Twitter, and I was the post game um, analyst on the radio for a couple of years. So I've always it's been a bunch of different things, but I've always tried to have uh, you know some connection to the union from from day one. Fantastic, yeah, yeah, story to history to it. But I think yeah, I mean, this season especially after such a near miss last year, I mean it must be so exciting coming into this season. Just to timestamp this, we are a couple of games in, so we have had the start of the season, but it's still very, very early, early doors. So, what were your thoughts coming into this season? Yeah, I mean the highest expectations there's ever been. I mean there's really no excuse for them to not win a trophy this year. You know, if you look sequentially at what they've done over the last couple of seasons, they made it to the conference finals in 2021. They made it to MLS Cup final last year. So <laughs> say if you're looking for the improvement, it would be to win something, you know, be it MLS Cup, Supporter Shield, Champions League, U.S. Open Cup. Um, and there's been a lot of it's it's good. I mean, there, there's more buzz for this team and a lot more respect for this team than there has been traditionally. Philadelphia. I'm not sure. I, I've you've probably done these videos with guys from New York or DC or Boston yeah, or whatever. Yeah. They'll probably tell you the same thing that um, you know the big northeastern or mid Atlantic markets in the United States are like old school baseball and football towns, and it's hard yeah. for soccer to gain traction here. But um, I think people have kind of at least come to respect like the the way that they play the the game, like this this hard nose kind of four four two uh, like German counter pressing diamond shape and just that they've got like blue collar like grinder guys who are just just good dudes there's no divas and they're not like rolling around <laughs> like the sixers in like uh fancy cars and dating supermodels you know there's no kardashians yeah. involved with the philadelphia <laughs> union you know what i'm saying so it's so it's like so that that's the that's where people kind of call it on at least they respect it hey they're really well run and and they you know they don't spend a ton of money but they overperform and i think there was that was reflective of the city which is a very like working class blue collar kind of kind of place and so that's that's how they turn the corner because a lot of people just did not care for the first eight to 10 years probably. Mm. And then when they got good, yeah. Win winning, winning cures everything, you know? I think, yeah, I think that from, uh, from talking to other fans, as you said, I have done a few of these now, and there's a lot of respect for Philadelphia for doing it the right way, for not just splashing cash and trying to get superstars in for, you know, get, bringing the youth through and, and really bringing through your own high quality players. And I think there's, there's a lot of be it um, positive or grudging respect. There's definitely a, an admiration there. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's it's funny too when people say, you know, when you say somebody's doing something the right way. I mean, there's always some subjectivity to it, you know. I mean, when the mm. LA Galaxy were winning titles with yeah. David Beckham and Robbie Keane, like, I mean, surely nobody said that they were doing it the wrong way. But no, at the absolutely, same, yeah, right. 
But at the same point, it's like you knew that you had, we, we're a country of like 330 million people. And, you know, let's say 50% are, are men. So that's 100, 150 plus 157.5 million or something like that, right? So there's there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't be canvassing, you know, the larger United States and building these academies and pulling these kids through because, I mean, there's there's that's the one thing that we just never did very well. You know, mm -hmm. it was very... You, you hear about pay to play and the soccer pyramid being turned upside down. Whereas in like, you know, other countries, it's like they identify kids at a young age and they get them in there, you know, and the, the, and soccer in this country for a long time was a suburban white sport where you needed money to play. And, you know, when the Philadelphia union really made that shift to, to the Academy model, it paid a lot of dividends for him. The first guy to come through the Academy and play for the first team was a West African immigrant who lived in, in West Philadelphia. Right. And that historically would not have been like the kind of kid who plays, you know who ends up playing for the for the team so yeah. it was good and, and they combine that with some money ball signings german pragmatism and get some uh you know get some uh shrewd signings in there and that's that's paid a lot of dividends for him you know absolutely and in more recent times i think the uh the work of jim Curtin can't be understated i mean he's got to be in with a shout of uh becoming the you know, most successful u.s manager ever with his uh with his star surely yeah. And then, they, you know, Jim, it wasn't always that way. You know, I mean, I was on the beat, um, you know, I was working for the team and then transition out of that when Jim first was promoted. And, you know, I knew Jim when he was an assistant coach back in the day, mm. uh, he wanted to come play for the Philadelphia union, but they, but they didn't, the coach at the time didn't want him. And so he ended up retiring early and going into coaching and, you know, he, the the commitment that they made to him, I, I don't know if people really remember this story, but uh, Rene Muenstein, who was with Manchester United for a while, you know, he, he they brought him in to be a consultant uh, when they transitioned from the former coach in 2013. And about half of the people in the Philadelphia running the Philadelphia Union wanted Muenstein to be the coach, and about half wanted Jim to be the coach. And you know, they could have fired him at any point over the last you know eight to ten years, but they decided to stick with him because they had a young guy who was local, was from Philadelphia, was putting the time and effort in. And they made that investment. And that's like, like, say what you will about pro rel, but you know, um, coaches are, and players are able to develop over here because you don't have the threat of relegation kind of over your, over your head. So that's one of the positive things, you know, I mean, Jesse Marsh, obviously, you know, didn't, <laughs> right. He's got to get results or else he's gone. You know, he, he wouldn't be able yeah. to, Jim Curtin would not be able to do what he did here if he was in Europe. And, you know, I think that just kind of points to the differences in the, uh, in the setup over here, you know? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, but he's got to be uh, one of the candidates for for, for the US M MNT job in the in the future, surely. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and he would, I'm sure he would jump at the chance to do that. You know, I, I, it's interesting with Jim because he could go to Europe and follow Jesse's path and go to like a Salzburg or, or something like that. Yeah. Uh, obviously, there's the connections. I mean, I don't think people realize how intertwined Jesse Marsh and Jim Curtin and Ernst Tanner really are because they all come, they all were connected in that Red Bull system mm. one way or another through new york salzburg hang on just one second here yeah all right we had a very impatient dog there who wanted to look at <laughs> that's all right we've got one of those here too yeah but they but they um yeah they would love to i'm sure that jesse and jim would probably tell you that that's their dream job is to coach mm. the united states of course i mean we've got a lot of stuff that we got to clean up over here you know we just um ended one cycle and then the next world cup is it is in our country you know so you gotta you gotta make yeah. sure you get it right i don't know if we're ahead of the curve with jesse or jim right now but yeah i mean they would they would they would probably love those gigs i don't know if jim would ever go to europe though i mean he lives in center city philadelphia he's from philadelphia he's got three young children so it's a lot to ask you're going to give up your security here to go over to europe and then you're fired after yeah. 10 games in which you lost nine you know <laughs> exactly so yeah it's a big yeah. risk and like i said a lot to ask of your family as well but yeah. just going back to the team at the moment obviously um i would say andre blake stands out as as uh you know one of the players who is absolutely phenomenal who else are your uh star players at the moment yeah jacob glessness uh the right center back was the mls defender of the year kai wagner the left back probably the best left back in the league got uh had interest from leeds yeah. actually and interest from some other teams overseas daniel Gajdag is a hungarian international number 10 who had i think 22 goals and 10 assists last year and they've got uh of two strikers who scored a boatload of goals this year julian carranza is a young guy from argentina and then uh Mikael Ua came over from Bromby in uh, Denmark. So they've got some quality there. I think I think that's the funny thing is that people always talk about the union as being this collective, like, you know, the 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 uh the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. But I mean, if you took these guys <laughs> apart individually, I mean, like half these dudes would start on any MLS team. Absolutely. Know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah so it's not, so it's, so I don't, I don't, I, I, you know, they play a very collective system and they press and they, they get out in transition and they, mm. they do a lot of good, um, you know, team first kind of things, but there's a lot of individual quality there. You know I mean? Andre is multiple time goalkeeper of the year and he's got like 50 plus caps for his national team. So I, I you can't, can't downplay that kind of stuff in terms of uh, individual talent. No, absolutely. There's some real superstars on there. There's no denying that at all. But, um, so, yeah, I mean, look, looking at that, the, you know, how this season's sort of starting to pan out, obviously we haven't got a huge amount of data yet. And obviously you said that the expectation is to win something. But how is the sort of squad size? Is it possible they could compete on a few different fronts or really should they just be going for uh, MLS Cup potentially? Yeah, it's tough because that's always been like the big thing where MLS fell short. You know, I mean, that's why we historically got our asses kicked in the CONCACAF Champions League because we just didn't have the depth to go down to play in Mexico and, and mm. compete with those squads. But now they have, they've increased the roster sizes a little bit. I think people will tell you that MLS squads used to be good from players like 1 through 12, and now it's probably good like 1 through 16. Yeah, The, the union played... Um, so we're recording this on a Wednesday in March. They played Tuesday night um, down in El Salvador, where they mm. rotated uh, every. They rotated eight guys, um, and that that would be that would that would to hear of an MLS team doing that f two to three years ago would have been unheard of, you know. But they they have more depth. They have a lot. They're going to play something like fifty five games this year. I want to say so. They have to really lean into that. Um, and Jim Curtin, like historically, has not. They just trust their sports science and they run their starting 11 out there over and over and over again. So mm. it's definitely a changing kind of thing. But I don't know if they can prioritize one over the other. They kind of just got to see how the results go early on and then shift from there. I mean, because if you bomb out of the Champions League early, okay, then you're focused more on the league, right? So it's kind of a, yeah, it's more of a, a read and react kind of thing. Absolutely. And there was uh, an extra player in the form of a dog in that match recently, yeah. <laughs> this week, wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> Which is no, that, I don't I don't know. I don't know what you guys think of do people in the UK have like a like a view on CONCACAF and like what it's like does it does CONCACAF seem like the Wild West to you guys over there? I think it used to. I think it's becoming a lot more into the sort of consciousness now as an actual proper <laughs> league and uh, you know and, and yeah. tournament and obviously I've the federation as a, as a whole. But no, I think that there is there, there is more education right now. I think it's because it's being streamed on things you know on, on more sort of uh, traditional mainstream networks now. There is a greater understanding yeah. of it. Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah, I mean that's that's like typical. We laugh over here because it's like you go down to El Salvador. The field is terrible. There's a dog running around. There's a, <laughs> a fence that looks like a dangerous fence with like exposed metal that looks. Looks like it was built in 1970 like they're pulling the fire alarm at the hotel it's 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 like it's funny because you go you go to like what other trip are you going to do in in europe that's like that i mean like i know that the team like if you're playing champions league or europa league like maybe you got to go out and play like mm. you know uh spartak moscow or something like that so the travel's there but i mean you're not really facing the same kind of I, it's just the hostility of having to go down to like Central America and like Mexico and whatnot. It's just is is crazy. And then they got to come back up here to the United States, and we we make them play in Denver in the snow. Yeah, you know? it's so a it's yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like a two way street. It's just it's it's crazy. The the um, I guess the point I'm trying to make is the variation in you know L elements and and mm -hmm. conditions and whatnot just makes Concacaf look like the the the, the final frontier compared to UEFA. You know. Well, we do have that with anyone who plays in the FA Cup. And then as a Leeds fan, I know it all too well of my team going out to teams in the sixth, seventh level of English football, you know, beyond those sort of levels of national league yeah. rounds and beyond where, you know, there is just sort of a capacity of a, of a few hundred up to a thousand and, you know, just rails around the edge. And they will Well, that's true. Yeah. And you're playing on like a cow pasture or something, yeah. you know, it's like you go down to like Boreham Wood or something and it's like, <laughs> exactly. oh, these guys, are, these guys are really up for this game. Wow. I didn't, I wasn't expecting this, you know. So, yeah. I'm yeah. impressed you know Boreham Wood. That's a deep cut, that one. No, I've been, I, thought, I was a like real journalist back in the day. You know, now I'm just a podcast host. But uh, yeah, we we did. You know, we it's, it's just fine, man. Because the Philadelphia, I mean, to to go along with that, the Philadelphia Union never never had a didn't even have a practice field mm. for the first like four or five years. I mean, that that's how green this team was. You talk about teams like Seattle and Portland coming into the league like 12 years ago. They came up from USL from a lower division, so they had infrastructure, they had training facilities and whatnot. The union got this stadium built. They didn't have a practice facility. They didn't have like a medical room. They didn't have mm. hot tubs or anything. They, they used to come down to the stadium. They would get in vans, and then the vans would take them to a public park. And like I remember going to that public park, and there's like um, this like uh, I, like I remember this from day one. There was like a uh, 
a landscaping crew and like a bunch of Latino guys were like on lunch break or something. So they just pulled up at the park and they were just four of them standing there watching Philadelphia Union training. Because <laughs> you know? it was like it wasn't some private facility. It was like they were out in a, in a park because they didn't have anywhere. So that so they've the point of me telling you that is they've just come they've come a long way in a in a short amount of time. That's fantastic. You wouldn't get that these days, I guess. Or the fans would just find them. <laughs> and this is no, it. yeah, and, and you know what? A lot of that stuff too. And fans used to come down. They, even when they did build their facility down in Chester, that you know, it was kind of like open. It wasn't like they had security around there. It wasn't like people were were lining the stadium. So I think people would just kind of drive through and kind of take a look at what they were doing. And I, it was funny. They were they were always kind of open to that because they were like, "Hey, we are. Well, I mean, we are what we are. We don't have any secrets here. Everybody knows how we play. Everybody knows who's going to be in the starting lineup." So. I think I think that helped too because they were they were not um like standoffish, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I found actually from from her people I've talked to who you know who are reporting on MLS or just fans, the the clubs are very welcoming to them and and uh, give them good access and you know help them out with actually their coverage, which makes a lot of sense because it makes your club more high profile. People are reporting on it. That's a good thing. It's not something yeah. to try and keep away. So. Yeah, I think I've got a better idea on that than than a lot of uh, European clubs, I would say. Yeah, they've been, I, you know, and it's it's that's how they have to be because you know if they're going to welcome people in, they have to be accommodating. And you know, I've been in every locker room in in Philadelphia. I've been in baseball locker rooms and basketball locker rooms and and hockey. And and the Philadelphia Union guys and the MLS guys have been the most welcoming and the most easy to work with by far because they're like us. They're like you and me, man. They they don't mm. make a ton of money or they didn't used to back in the day. Yeah. And um, they're not like divas. They're not super stars they don't have 40 people in their posse like like with them you know so just it, it, so it was good to be able to like it's easy to build relationships with those guys and they're good with the media and i think um the funny thing too is that you know in europe the locker rooms are closed right so you guys yeah. have like um you know they'll bring them out to the to the corner sky sports is standing there holding the microphone right. and they might yeah, get, like yeah. harry harry kane and like like uh son might be standing next to him right but we're, like we're able to walk into the locker rooms and talk mm -hmm. to these guys and you get one v one time that you don't normally get elsewhere so it just, it just allows you to kind of like get to know these guys and like okay i i know who kevin is like i trust him and you know yeah. i know who this guy is and i trust him because i think a lot of times like you you don't get to do that you know and so it's it's, it's a little weird for the european guys because they're not used to it when they come over to mm. mls they're just trying to put their trousers on, right? Is that what you guys say? Trousers? They're trying to put their yeah, trousers another on. One, yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> and like they, I'm standing there with a the recorder, you know? So it's a little weird for them, but they get used to it and they tell me that they like it because it's just easier to like kind of like understand what's going on, you know? Absolutely. It seems like a much nicer you know, sort of interaction from everyone's point of view. But they just get onto the fans there, actually. What the um the, the, they they seem very, very engaged, the local people and, and the you know, the Philly fans seem seem really, really passionate. Are there different sort of factions, fan groups and different you know, places around the stadium where different places sit? People sit? Yeah, yeah, there are. I mean, they have a, a dedicated fan section. It's called the River End. Mm -hmm. which was primarily occupied by a group called the Sons of Ben, who were responsible for creating the team in the first place. I mean, really the genesis of the union, it's a great story because they, um, it was just a bunch of fans sitting around at a pub and they said, hey, we want an MLS team here too. So they lobbied the league for it and they got somebody to come in and they they created it. So it, it's, it's good because it flies in the face of a lot of other MLS stories where it's like, oh, you just have to pay your $40 million franchise fee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that wasn't the genesis of the union was not that. It was very grassroots. Mm. But um, a lot of those original people who got the team like off the ground, they've moved on and left. And the Sons of Ben, there, there's been groups that have splintered off from them. So you got the Sons of Ben, you got the Keystone State Ultras, you've got a couple of different groups that sit in that section. But uh, yeah, Philly sports fans are are the real deal. I mean, they they love it. They're obsessed with it, and you know they're selling out that stadium now. Yeah, absolutely. With yeah, which is fantastic to see. I mean, that's that's, that's the, the the cornerstone of every any football club is setting out that stadium, and getting the big roar yeah. from the fans, and yeah, and making people really not relish a trip there, which is which is fantastic. So yeah. talking about the fans, what was the reaction to the shirt? I know there was a lot of mixed ones there. I potentially, well, so personally, absolutely love it. I think it's a brilliant shirt than the, the new twenty twenty three one. I'll overlay it here for people at home. But what were your thoughts? This is um, the Thomas one. That has yes, that's of, right. Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know wow, you didn't like the sponsor there. Yeah, I, I know. I mean, I think it's cool. I'm not. It's weird because I come from a media background, so I don't wear, I don't buy jerseys, and I don't yeah. wear jerseys because, like, you know, back in the day, it was like it's kind of different with new media now. But you were never supposed to take anything from the team. You're never supposed to wear like a team's colors in the in the press box. You were never. You know, I, I found that to be a very American thing because we would have like South American teams come here 
Real Madrid would come over for a friendly or something, and Real Madrid media would be sitting there wearing a Real Madrid jersey. I'm like, what the hell yeah. is this? This is so strange, you know. But I, I, the fans dig it, I, you know, and they've they've um, responded well to what they've they've done so far. So I think that's cool. I, I think Bimbo is a good sponsor for the union and they've been loyal to them for a long time they're actually based mm -hmm. they're local they're a mexican company but their north american headquarters is in the philadelphia region right um, gotcha gotcha okay yeah in a, in a town called horsham that's like a half hour from me and, and so they they've been good with the union i just hate i hate sponsors in general because when i yeah. when i when i'm if i'm an athlete like i think these guys are athletes i don't think that they're walking advertisements like i think if um Give it, give you, if, give me a Leeds player, Pascal Stroik, right? I mean, mm -hmm. like he's a, he's a, he's a football player, right? He's not an advertisement for bagels, you know. So I don't, I don't like, I don't like turning <laughs> yeah. these guys into adver advertisements, you know. I mean, I get it. I know it's a necessary evil, but I just, I just think it's cheap. I'm not gonna buy something that has, has says like of uh, English muffin on the front of it, you know? <laughs> no, absolutely right. I mean, it's, it, it's very rare that they, they actually go well. And I think actually it, from this year's crop, the 2023 crop, crop of shirts, there are some which the spoil, sorry, sorry the, the sponsor's really spoiling the shirt. It's a really nice yeah. shirt. And they put this name across the middle. You think, well, that's ruined it. I mean, it's just, just no, I know. I know. It's because they got the, they got these beautiful designs and whatnot. And, and like, you know, they have the Apple TV thing now on the sleeve. And yeah. You know, to to me, the, to me, guys in any sport should only have three things on their jersey: their name, their number, and the the crest of whatever team they're playing for. And I, I just I feel like it cheapens, um, you you know, the overall like uh, aesthetic, I guess, for lack of a better word. I know that I know that's different in different cultures. Like you go down to Mexico and Central America, and they'll plaster, they'll fill the jersey up with. Oh, yes. with yeah, 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 and that's that's almost become like synonymous with with them. So when they play the team from El Salvador, Alianza, like they're they got like forty sponsors on there. So that's okay. I mean, I just I just think it's a little, you know, I well, I always use the example. I'm like, look, if you if you were a Philadelphia Eagles fan, and you had a like a Randall Cunningham jersey that said, um you know primo hoagies on the front of it how how <laughs> cheap would that make that, that shirt? Would, like would you buy something that said hoagies on the front of it you know no exactly and there's a very rarely then there are some classic shirts where the sponsor is synonymous with the team and the winning and that you know that's ingrained into you but i yeah. think that's going to come with time and it's not going to work every time i think it's going to no. be a lot more than it actually makes better you know yeah yeah so good stuff. So broadening out, just uh, looking at this year and um, thinking about the, you know, the 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 entirety of the MLS. And I wanted to just before we finish, really just hone in on on some of what what you think might be uh, happening with this season. So um, if Philly obviously have got a chance of the of the M of MLS Cup, we could be looking at different priorities within that. But who do you think's got the best chance of winning the cup this year? You know, it's hard for me to um, to bet against LAFC. You know, because mm. they're they're the defending champs and they've still got a great team and. You know, I mean, they they should probably be the front runner for it. I mean, I know a lot of people picked Philly. Um, it's going to be hard to balance the, a bunch of competitions, but uh, I mean, they were right there. I mean, it went down to penalty kick. Technically, they didn't even lose the final, right? It was a draw, and and then they went, and then they exactly. lost on PK. Exactly. So, so, uh, you know, I I would say I don't I wouldn't even say one and two. I would say LA one A and and Philly one B. You know, I, I think yeah. what happens is that if they if they lose in the Champions League rather early, I think you definitely try to win the supporter shield. I, I, I'm one of those people who thinks that the shield means more than MLS Cup because I just like the way that they do it, that, that you guys do it in Europe. You know, I, I like a balanced schedule. We don't have a balanced schedule over here. It's hard to do in a country this big. Mm, but yeah. I, I just like the fact that to, to me, it's harder to be excellent over the course of 30, however many games, versus going on a run in the playoffs and winning like six in a row. You know, Absolutely. so that, that's, that's just. That's just my philosophy. And like I, I Americans don't really get that. I've had to when the union won the shield in 2020, I had to explain the shield like 400 times over and over again. <laughs> they say, oh, it's like it's like when the Flyers win the Eastern Conference. Like, not really, you know, but I just think it's very I, I think the shield's more important. I think the union would get a bump in town if they won MLS Cup, because I think more people would understand that. Yeah. And be able to connect that to the to the right. We have this term in Philadelphia called four for four which means you support the four major North American sports and then they kind of keep the union out of it. It's a whole nother big thing. But I think if we wanted to like make some inroads with those casuals, MLS cup would be the biggest, uh, biggest success. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 And I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you on the, on the season thing if you, to do it over 40 games or 34 games in, in MLS. I think it's, it's a much, much bigger achievement than 
playing your way through a few games at the end of a season. And uh, yeah, and I remember yeah. I heard from from uh, on your podcast you were talking about how you're not a fan of uh, penalty shootouts as the way to decide things as you as you've alluded to there again. And I think that's another thing that it just seems so desperately unfair. I mean, obviously as a, as an English person coming off the European Championships to lose on penalties yeah. there, it's it just seems it just it doesn't seem right or, or or it doesn't seem like it's on merit. You know, like like. Football in itself is a meritocracy. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. If you're good at football or good at soccer, you can come up and you can be the best. So that's why it's built on this meritocracy. But penalty kicks just doesn't seem to carry that through for me. No, no, and not just penalty kicks to decide games that you know go the extra thirty, and then there's a draw. Uh, you know, um, too many big games just hinge on penalty decisions and VAR, and yeah. it encourages strikers flopping and diving and embellishing and, and there's there's too many big moments in soccer football where you know you have a tight game or something and there's some mm -hmm. like ticky tack it's an american term ticky tack where it's like kind of cheap i guess is a synonym for it you know where right. it's like i, I don't mean if, if if chelsea and real madrid are in a banger and the game's like one one going into like the 80th minute or something a game that good shouldn't be decided because some guy like barely trips over in, in Golo Conte's leg, you know, what I mean, I mean, there's too, there's too many big, there's too many pivotal moments in big games that are decided by cheap stuff like that. So I would like, I would like all of the my my the, my proposal, and nobody will ever go for this, but my proposal has been from the beginning to replace all uh, in the box penalties with um, with indirect free kicks instead. Right, um, I, th I think that's a much better way of doing. Yeah. If you give away. Uh, if you found someone next to the goal line on the edge yeah. of the 18-yard box, so a position where you could never score from unless you were Roberto Carlos curling it in from the side, that's mm. a penalty still. But your chances of scoring from that spot were pretty much zero. So how yeah. can your reward be a free kick at goal from 18 yards? Uh, so yeah, for, well, yeah, and I mean, if you have... And, and like if there's a, something egregious, if Luis Suarez swats it off the line with his hand okay you yeah. send him off and it's a penalty or whatever i but you know they've made they've made changes to the denial of a goal scoring opportunity rule where they try to avoid triple jeopardy yeah right you yeah. got a you got a red card you got a penalty and then that guy's suspended next week anyway so i don't think that every infraction in the box needs to needs to be penalized that way i've been a center back my entire life i, I can't I see guys go up there and they're holding their hands behind their back. And I'm like, what are, what are we teach? Are we teaching kids that <laughs> defending in the box? They got to put their hands behind their back. Like, they that's, are that's doing not, it now though. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. That's not how it should, it should ever be. And when we get to that point, it tells me that there's way too much riding on um, a lot of incidental contact yeah. and things that are, that are bang, bang kind of plays. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that's the yeah. thing that one of the next things that needs to change. I, I'm, I'm hopefully, you know, I think there would be some movement towards that if a lot of penalties keep getting given. But anyway, well, I don't, I don't, I would just say too, like real yeah, quickly on. on that, I could go on for seven hours about that. But I, <laughs> but I, I, I don't, I, I get the sense, and you can probably speak to this better than I can. But I get the sense too that like the greater football world kind of like looks down on American opinions on that because we're Yanks and we don't know what the hell we're talking about. So I think it needs to come. I think like the the charge to change any kind of penalty rules or whatever, I think would have to be led by Europe or maybe South America. Because I think if the, if the, if American voices push really hard to change this or change that, the kind of the pushback you get is like, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, the Yanks are trying to change the game again. I'm like, I, I, it's not really the case. I mean, we're playing the same game as everybody else. Now we don't have the old exactly. MLS. We don't have, we don't have cheerleaders anymore in MLS. You know what I mean? So we're, we're all playing the same game now. And I just think, I think there could be a little bit more pragmatism when it comes to that. Yeah. I think so, and I think that, you know it's it's a bit churlish people to to say that. I don't think it's helpful people to say that because MLS does things a lot better than European football does in a lot of cases as well. I think it's you know there, there is just a lot of that, but I think there's a lot of fear from from the European side, um, you know, and 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 you know prejudices from from that that, that kind of thing. But anyway, going back to uh, to MLS, who do you think is going to be uh, topping the scoring tables? Who's going to be top scorer this year? Oh man. Um... I love Sebastian Driussi from Austin. Yeah, I mean he's probably going to be near the top. Um, you know the LAFC guys are always a danger to get there. Um, mm. Daniel Gosh, dog for the Union's probably going to be close to the top again. Yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, I gotta admit I don't pay too much attention to the strikers because I'm a defensive guy. That's like all the breakdowns I do, are like all all defense, yeah, yeah. you know, because no, because I don't think D mids and center backs get enough love, but uh, mm. but probably one of the Austin guys or the LA guys. Yeah, no, I wouldn't be inclined to agree. I also also agree on the D mid point. I think there's there's a there's a big unsung hero 
sort of contingent there. And I know yeah. certain big names do come out. You know, you've got Conte's, Calvin Phillips, those sort of guys do get the love sometimes, but there's a lot of hard work that's gone on there that, you know, don't hit headlines a lot of the time. That's just, you know, and that's natural too. I mean, I, I see that in Europe and the United States are the same thing because I think, you know, kids grow up and they want to do nutmegs and techers and they want to score goals or whatever. Nobody, nobody says, I want to be the next, like, john stones you know um <laughs> but even i mean he's like an amazing player you know he's a great yeah player, yeah great ball. He plays for manchester city but you don't you don't have that's just not like what people are inclined to to get into so i think it falls on people like us to try to you know show show some love to like the the yaya torres of the world you know <laughs> exactly for me it was yeah. david batty growing up i have to say yeah but, yeah, yeah 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 no i loved me i loved all those like i i one of my favorite things is watching the the Roy Keane and Patrick Vieira. Um, uh, I, I don't. It's not really a documentary, I guess. But they're sitting like two feet away from each other, yeah. just talking about all the battles that they had, like in the in the heyday of the Premier League. You know, like I love that stuff. I, I and that that's like interesting too. How do you how do you convince a guy like a young kid like, hey, you could be the next next great, um, you know, uh, Gennaro Gattuso. You know, you know what I mean. Like, yeah, that's, that's hard. It's hard to do. You know. Absolutely, yeah. It doesn't catch the imagination the same, does no, it? No, no, no. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Kevin, for joining me today. Um, where can people find you on the internet? Yeah, yeah. Crossingbroad.com. Uh, it's always soccer and Philadelphia podcast. I'm on Twitter uh, at underscore Kevin underscore Kincaid. It's K-I-N-K-E-A-D. Yeah, hit me up if anybody ever wants to talk. I try to get back to everybody. I've got two young kids who occupy a lot of my time, but I always try, I always try to make time for readers, you know? fantastic yeah you've been really accommodating with me with me today so i really appreciate your uh, your input today and uh, yeah best of luck for the season yeah no problem thanks man appreciate it tom cheers